I'm the last before break. <laughs> hey. um, I'm a smoker as well, so I can't wait for the break. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah, my name's Paul Greenwood. I'm a project manager for the Restrain Yourself uh, programme that is run jointly with Aqua, who I work for. And I was just going to point to Joy, but she's just vanished. <laughs> with jo Joy Duxbury from the University of Central Lancashire. This is a joint partnership between us both, including the University of Manchester and the University of Liverpool. Um, Aqua, who I work for, uh, is a, a quality improvement organisation for health and social care. Uh, and we're a membership-based organisation in the northwest of England. So we cover from Cheshire up to Cumbria. So in terms of this project, I do the quality improvement work um, and the university do the evaluation. Um, and my background is as a nurse. Oh, I oh yes, we got um, our bid monies through the Health Foundation um, to run this two-year project and we're 18 months into the, the work. So what I'm going to talk about today is what we've found so far. There's not a lot of data in terms of we can definitely say, yeah, we've reduced, on every ward, uh, restraint. But some of the early awards that we've got, we've got some evidence of actual reductions. We did start with a 40% reduction in restraint over two years. <laughs> and then the steering group said, no, we'll call it eight. Let's go for 80%. Um, <laughs> so that's our intention. In two years, we want to see an 80% reduction in physical restraint and that people are able to implement a robust approach to uh, improving quality and patient safety. So in the North West, we actually have eight mental health trusts. One of the trusts couldn't get involved in the, the programme. So we cover seven trusts. We've done it in three waves, six months per wave. And in that six months, I will spend one day a week on the ward uh, working with the, with the team to reduce restraint. Each trust has two wards that they allocate for this project. One is a comparator ward, and one is the intervention ward. I work with the intervention ward. The comparator ward gets the evaluation from the university pre and post, but then they get nothing from me, um, saying that I've been busy enough just working with the intervention <laughs> wards, to be honest. Um, so over the last 18 months, I've been working with these wards. I'm currently working with where three wards and that ends in December, and then sometime around the spring, late spring, we'll have the full report. So this is what we've done in terms of quality improvement. Um, when we talk to staff about quality improvement, they just stir blankly <laughs> at us. It's got its own language. Um, some of it's completely illegible. Um, so we've tried to turn it into this kind of six-step toolkit so people can clearly understand when we talk about quality improvement, what we mean by it. And that's purely around following the plan, do, study, act cycles, uh, about gathering your evidence, uh, looking at where the gaps are, trying out different ideas, testing it out until you get it right. And if it doesn't work, bin it, get rid of it. When we say that to staff you can bin something, they're quite like that, because there are plenty of things they do on the wards that they'd like to bin. <laughs> So around this uh, particular programme, we're looking at implementing the six core strategies that Kevin Huckshaw uh, talked about this morning across these intervention wards, seven wards in all. We have a set of measures um, uh, around both violent incidents, physical restraint, and the number of days between physical restraints and violent incidents, and balancing measures around PRM medication and seclusion and use of transfers to a PICU. Because again, I think as Kevin mentioned this morning, what we didn't want to see is a reduction in restraint on award, but we see increases in transfers to PICU or increases in PRM medication. So in terms of how we implemented this programme, we worked with the intervention team, we trained up the uh, identified staff in those teams on quality improvement techniques. We trained the whole team and in some instances, that was a whole team going out for the day um, on the actual six core strategies and the wider Restrain Yourself program. I also do on-site weekly visits um, over the six months that I'm there. So I'm sat on shift with the team, and that includes night staff, 
Um, and then after that wave, I pop onto the ward to check how people are doing in terms of the um, six core strategy implementation. So every site has got ongoing plan, do, study, act cycles around each element of the six core strategies. They've got the measures in place. Now, the way we've done the measures is we have a thing called a safety cross. So on the office wall, there is a kind of cross-looking thing. It's, a, it's essentially a calendar, and you literally put a cross in the box for that particular date. Very simple uh, tool. Some people don't like doing day ticks because they'll be on it all day inputting information. So we just wanted a very quick way of the staff visually seeing what is happening on the ward at that time. Um, so what we tend to find is you'll have a, lots of blanks and then you'll have piles of crosses at the weekend, for example. <laughs> so you get your, like, everything comes like buzzes. Um, we also have one for, there's one for restraint and there's one for violent incidents. The one for restraint, we clearly state to staff that falls in line with the NICE definition. Um, in terms of violent incidents, we've left that up to them to decide. If they thought that was a violent incident, then it's for them to, um, to put a cross in the box. Alongside that, I collect that data on a monthly basis and I put up a visual chart, which I'll show you in a bit. Um, that chart, again, gives them an opportunity to look at what's been happening on that ward over a period of time. And also we ask all of the trusts, I think most of them have signed up to the Restraint Reduction Network as part of this. Just an excellent, is this, is this vodka or water? <laughs> right, this is called a driver diagram. Um, a driver diagram is essentially a plan on a page. So you'll notice at the end we've got the aim statement, in the middle we have the six core strategies. So we have leadership, Around leadership, what we've asked each of the wards to look at is the philosophy of care and values that are uh, linked in with the Restraint Reduction Network values. And also to look at things like an executive walking around uh, the unit, getting to know the staff, talking to the patients. And also what's called a 15-step, do people come across 15-step challenge? Uh, we've been asking them to implement those, and those have done, gone down quite well on the wards. Around data-informed... Uh, practice, again, visual display of data in the office. Staff input tons of data, um, and I sit in the offices on wards, and I just, I'm amazed at the amount of information that gets put into the system, and the team never see it again. Um, for me, the safety crosses and having a graph on the wall, visual data for the team has been really helpful in keeping a discussion going on the unit about what is happening on our ward but not just for the office staff. What I've asked all of the teams to do is, how do you then have that conversation and inform the patients of that data as well? So how do you get a conversation going in community meetings? In terms of workforce development, we have de-escalation sessions. Rather than sending people off to training, what we've asked is trainers to go onto the ward, work with some identified champions around de-escalation. Generally, staff are really good at it to train them up, support them, and that they were allocated a set number of staff on that ward who they work with to support in terms of de-escalation techniques. I have to say that works really well because the training around de-escalation is more relevant about what's happening here and now on that ward uh, rather than that horrendous situation. If they get trained up, by the time they got back to the ward, you've forgotten half of it. Um, so there's something about keeping it real for, for staff. Handovers. Um, it's been a key issue. I've sat in that many handovers. Um, I've either been absolutely bored out of my mind. Um, some have gone on it within 20 minutes and some have gone on for over an hour. Um, and I've walked out and I can't remember any of it. Um, and I, I came across a lot of handovers that were like that, where staff really didn't understand why they were doing handovers. They got nothing out of it. Uh, they were boring. Um, they were very vague. There were distractions around, oh, what were you doing at the weekend, and, uh, and all the usual stuff. So it was a bit about tightening up the handovers that they, were, they needed to be improved, because there were bits of information missing. I think one of Lynn's points, safeguarding issues, the amount of handovers I sat in, and it was just fluke that somebody there knew this patient and knew that two years ago they had sexually assaulted somebody. 
and it was like a look of the draw that certain information would be lost or would um, would be t would be passed on in the, the handover. Um, so there's a lot of work around tidying up the way pe the information was communicated. Around restraint reduction tools, I'll talk about the My Safety Plan in a bit, which is a self-management tool based around triggers and early warning signs. Sensory rooms, some of the wards I'm working with have developed sensory rooms or where they haven't got that because there's just not the space. Um, they've got essentially the trolley, but the safe ward stuff really in terms of the, the boxes of tools that they utilise. Advanced statements and advocacy support. In terms of patient roles, we've looked at things like the community meeting and the, the peer support worker role. Um, and again, this thing of community meetings, because we've got staff talking about restraint, and again, as has been said time and time again today, I've yet to meet a member of staff who likes restraining somebody. Um, I have not met anyone. Nobody likes it. When the patients were informed of that via the community meetings in discussions with staff, a lot of the patients were amazed that staff didn't like restraining people. So there was a bit of a conversation to be had with patients on the ward about um, what restraint means to them, um, how they feel if they're a witness to somebody being restrained, um, how they feel about the mood on the ward, and what part they can play in it. And we've got examples at one ward where um, the day before somebody had actually trashed all the pictures on the wall. Um, and this was brought up at the community meeting about the mood of the ward. Um, and this particular patient talked about why she did that and apologised to people on the, on the ward if they were upset by the fact that she'd smashed everything. Um, she described why that happens, it was her illness, da, 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 da. But it actually de-escalated the whole situation because there were other patients who were really angry about what this particular individual had done. But it was an opportunity for them to actually sort it out in an adult way, in a managed way, and move on. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about community meetings in a minute. And then, of course, debriefing. We do uh, debriefs in two ways. We have an informal debrief and then a formal one. In terms of the informal debrief, that's literally the corridor conversation after an incident. And that is literally three questions. Um, are you okay? Is the patient okay? And what happened? And you can do that in 30 seconds sometimes. It can be done and dusted and you move on what you need to do. Um, a more formal debrief, we have a, a simple fo uh, format that they follow. And then there is a patient debrief that was um, about 12 questions. Uh, but rightly, patients would say, why would I answer those questions in that way? Um, you might as well say to me, did I enjoy being restrained? Because it seemed a pointless exercise. So what we're doing now is we ask the, the patient to tell their story, um, let them just talk it through, and then we'll take a kind of sh short narrative of that and pull out certain <laughs> themes uh, to do with their, their experiences rather than be asking 20 questions. So those are some of the things that we've been implementing. These are what we call the must-dos in terms of um, the project. So as I already said, we trained the team. We did an improvement workshop. I offer coaching and mentoring to, to the teams. Um, we look at the 15-step challenge and exec walk round, and I do my regular um, site visits. Um, <clears throat> this is a big one, really. <laughs> This is just some of the challenges <clears throat> that what I found was, <laughs> and these are common to every ward I've been on. Um, there are real challenges in the system at the moment. And I have to say that at times, staffing levels seem to take up most of staff's time just managing staffing levels um, and the use of agency and bank. Um, and this balance between newly qualified and experienced staff there are some of the wards I'm working on really struggle because they've got a high level of newly qualified staff and very few experienced staff. Um, and you can see some of the newly qualified struggling at times um, and that need for supervision and support from more experienced qualifieds would be really helpful. Um, a big one for me and particularly around uh, restraints has been blanket rules and unwritten rules. There are lots of unwritten rules uh, in um, services I'm working with. 
and a lot of knee-jerk reactions. Something that happened over on a unit 20 miles away has suddenly become the way you have to do things on that ward, yet that never happened on that ward. So everyone's following a particular rule that actually makes no sense. Um, smoking rules are a huge problem. Um, a current one I'm working on, I have a smoking rule of 15 minutes on the hour every hour. So the whole day is spent with patients talking about smoking. Um, coming to the office, can I have a cigarette, can I have a cigarette? Um, so I asked that that rule be removed because that rule was creating real problems in, in terms of staffing the courtyard for this particular 15 minute rule. Um, and when they agreed to remove the rule, so it became an open policy for smoking, the patient stood up and clapped the team. <laughs> um, and there's been no problems with that, and it's been a month now that they've had that. They've had absolutely no problems, it's not been abused, and life's a lot better on the ward, and there's a lot of tension disappeared. And people aren't thinking about smoking now, and when they're having the next smoke, they're actually saying, well, can we do some activities now, and can I do this? And they're more engaged around wanting to do other stuff. Um, so sometimes some of the rules actually are, are extremely restrictive. And also knee-jerk reactions from a trust where an incident happens, a memo goes out and everyone suddenly has to remove this or remove that. Um, that we had one instance where this happened, this, this memo went out, suddenly everyone's removing belts and pyjama cords and God knows what else. Uh, and then they pulled that memo because it was ridiculous what they were asking. Um, and said, oh, it'll be all sorted and it's fine now. He's saying, well, but it's out there. Now it's out there. It'll take probably two years to remove that from people's heads. Um, we have issues around observation policies that are very inflexible. And for me, where a registered nurse does not have the opportunity to, to remove somebody from an observation, and you're having to bring agency staff in to cover if you've got two, three people on OBS, because half your team's taken up then doing observations. And it's down to a consultant to do that. I, I just find that a bit weird. It's, it just doesn't work. Um, I think there needs to be more flexibility in terms of registered, experienced nurses, just particularly over a weekend, being able to take people off observations in a very flexible way. And that might be just for a few hours. Um, and I just think it helps staff to manage the environment a lot better. And also observation practice is not about the sitting in a chair, flicking through your mobile phone, um, as I've seen many particular agency staff do, that this about being more active around observations, getting people involved in active, meaningful activities on the ward. Um, otherwise, they're just walking up and down the, the ward and sitting outside bedroom doors, and it doesn't look great, and it just doesn't work. Something we found from the, the debriefs was um, overcautious prescribing. And I've seen a number of times where I've had to discuss with staff where I've seen some patients extremely tormented and they're just not getting the, the right medication, that they are left for days and days because a decision will not be made um, to the point where on three instances, three debris, formal debris we did, um, that was the cause of the restraint because it got to that point where that person <coughs> was so tormented they started wrecking the place and assaulting staff and other patients. So there's something about working with the consultant body to address this issue of how medication prescribing is working. It's as if we've gone from over-sedating people to the point where they'll be giving out IM five milligrams of olanzapine for somebody where it's clearly stating in their notes that this doesn't touch this person. Yet you just restrain them to give them something that doesn't work for them. <laughs> it's just like bizarre. Um, some of this about prioritising... Um, the checklist for the nurse in charge, just real issues about these endless long lists of things to do, meds, security, OBS, and so it goes on. Um, and patient contact time is like bottom of the list. Um, there are no peer support workers on wards in the Northwest yet. We've tried it, we had a real problem with the policy. Thankfully, the trust board are now looking at that policy. In every team I've worked with, they felt they had no influence in terms of how to improve the ward. Um, it may not be true that they do actually have influence, but they feel that they don't have influence. Um, so it's been really difficult to engage when they just look at me and sort of roll their eyes and see me as, oh, you're somebody else with something else for us to do. Um, I'm just another layer of bureaucracy that's there to, to add to the already heavy workload. 
a real disconnect from uh, board to ward, which is why we wanted the execs to do more of a ward range. And almost thanking the staff for the work they do, because they work bloody hard, I have to say. I'm, uh, I've been quite impressed with the, uh, um, the level of work and loyalty that they give to the service. Um, and I think boards need to be a bit more connected to their teams. Activity coordinator roles, some wards had them, some didn't. I think they are key on any ward. And this thing about sector-based consultants, that there's one consultant for that ward, so that it improves the multidisciplinary working rather than three or four consultants where a team is essentially feeding ward reviews rather than working with um, one consultant. So those are some of the challenges. And they all kind of created a culture that was driven by task to me. And it's been trying to, part of the six core strategies has been getting the staff to think differently about um, the way in which they work, that the task shouldn't be the priority, it's about the patient. So if we create spaces where the rules are more flexible, or we get rid of certain rules because they make no sense, like why you're suddenly doing lockdown at that time of night, and as, as Kevin Wright said this morning about if somebody wants a glass of orange juice, just get them a glass of orange juice. Um, but And I've had some staff, particularly on nights, have said, um, they do as I say, because when I'm on nights, this is how it works. <laughs> so I have to like, challenge some of that kind of attitude. Um, but there's something about shifting it from task and creating spaces for both patients and staff um, to talk about what is happening for them. Uh, what is the mood like? What's it like when it's quite difficult on the ward, when it's quite chaotic uh, on the ward? So I've already gone through a lot of these. Um, as I said, these are the kind of must-do stuff that we've done. There is other stuff. Um, for example, the community meetings are, are a great way to talk about the mood on the ward. And working with some of the service users, what they said would be good was rather than say in a community meeting, oh, this week we've had three restraints. <laughs> People don't want to get into that. Uh, what they wanted to talk about was the general mood, so use language that fitted uh, and was uh, sort of respected the environment. And one of the service users said, what about using weather symbols? Just saying, like, is it stormy on the ward? Is it cloudy? Is it sunny? And we thought, oh, what a great way, because that's an easy thing to measure. Um, so a number of the wards now, when they do community meetings, and they do them on a regular basis, i.e. more than three or four times a week, um, that they talk about the mood, and they start by talking about the weather, and it's almost democratic. They'll put their hands up and say, how many people think it's been sunny in the past 24 hours? How many it's been cloudy or whatever? Very simple thing to do. Uh, and what we've found is, uh, on some of the wards, that those people who have been discharged, their feedback has been, I really liked it when it was sunny on the ward. So we can follow it, we can follow that, that through the, um, with that individual patient. But we also can, at the end of the month, say, as a percentage, how sunny or stormy has it been on this ward? And then what can we do about that if it's been 80% stormy? What's that about? Um, but it's an easy thing to measure. Um, the patients totally get it, and the patients like to talk about the mood on the ward. And one of the shocking things for me was when I first started with Wave 1, I met with eight of the patients on one ward. And I asked them about how they felt being restrained. And one of them said, and all the others nodded in agreement, and a big discussion happened after it, was to be restrained was worse than rape. And I was like, hmm. And I thought it was really, a really powerful thing. Um, and some of the staff on the ward just couldn't believe that, that it was worse than rape. And they said, well, when you're a woman and you're confronted by a group of strangers coming at you, male and female, it doesn't really matter, and you're not quite sure what they're going to be doing, usually get raped by one individual, but not when there's five people. I don't know what you're going to be doing to me. Um, so you need to think about that. And we had a great conversation with these patients on the ward um, who also recognised that they knew that if they wanted something, they would shout really loud. They would smash the place up to get something quickly. So they also knew that they were um, part of the problem as well. But it was about the staff and, and, and patients working together to uh, talk about that, talk about the sensitive issues in that ward environment. The, the My Safety Plan, we took the triggers, early warning signs and calming strategies that Kevin talked about this morning, 
And the patients wanted it in a nice little booklet, colourful, easy to complete. Um, so we developed this booklet, they were happy with it, we tried it out and it's worked extremely well. This is now in admission packs on the wards that I've worked on so that patients can have a read through them. On the back of them are lots of examples for each, as Kevin showed this morning, the quick examples. And we've asked staff to sit down with patients, look at those examples and start, that, start a conversation. What patients have said to us is they never thought about it like that. Nobody's ever talked to them about triggers, early warning signs and calming strategies. They find that extremely helpful. Um, and in a number of instances, we've had patients said, I'm going to use this at home. In fact, one woman says, I'm going to use it with meal husband because <laughs> he's got a few triggers he needs to sort out. Um, but it was quick and easy. The problem we have with it is we're having to attach it to care plans because when we tried to put it onto the IT system, it just didn't work. So there's something about the IT system needs to change. And I have to say, when we did it on one care plan, the safety plan better reflected that individual than the care plan did. The care plan gave you no sense of that person whatsoever. The safety plan did. But they've been extremely positive, particularly with female, uh, on female wards. This is the kind of data we put up. Um, <clears throat> so what you've got is you've got the green line, which is your average, and then you've got the two upper and control limits. Everything within the upper and lower control limits for this ward, so you've got month by month, so there's roughly around 14, 15 months of data here. Um, where we've got the Himalayas going on here, actually all of that within those two control, upper and lower controls is perfectly predictable for that ward. There is nothing interesting really in that, within those two control limits. The bit that is interesting is, is when it goes up beyond that line. And in this particular instance, that's two patients who were, the, uh, who were related to those um, 45 restraints in one month. <laughs> and that happened over a matter of a couple of weeks and they were transferred to PICU. Um, in both instances, there were essentially inappropriate admissions to that acute mental health ward. The other way of one word, we had another example where there were some like 30 restraints in that month, and that was one patient. Um, and what we see is that the dotted line is the period when I worked with that ward, and how, I, how nice that it, it drops back down. <laughs> it drops and drops. This is not the case with all the wards. I put this on because this is the one where, this is the early data really, where we can show that the point when the, um, the blue dots essentially fall below the green line, which is around an average of 11 restraints. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven months of it being below their average. We can now say, after seven months, we can pretty much say there's been a change on this ward. So we drop the average. Um, and the maths work, and I'm rubbish at maths, but the maths suddenly work it out, and we now have an average from 11 restraints down to five restraints per month. And that team is still working at keeping that uh, reduced down. What this particular team now say is that they de-escalate a lot and where there are restraints is because of patients where they've really struggled when they need to take their medication, they've had to do IM. And restraints for them has been the only option. And in one instance, the pa and they're phased out prone as well in this trust. But this particular patient on one occasion just put herself on the floor in a prone position without anybody going near, near them. I think there was a comment today about, I think it was from the T's and S one, about training up the staff in there to say, give, you're giving injections in different sites. You can do it stood up, sat down. Why do we need to be putting people on the floor? So we can see that it's worked on this particular ward. Some of the other wards, it's either been neutral because the, the averages are around one or two restraints per month really small numbers um, um, so it's a bit mixed some wars have gone up a little bit but we're still early days you need at least two two years plus to really see has this made a difference it's nice if it drops down for a few months you go, oh yeah it's great everything's fine but the reality is the reality is it can go back up very quickly but that's an acute inpatient ward you'd expect that there will be blips. There are good weeks, bad weeks. There's a good hour and there's a bad hour. That's how the wards work. Same with violent incidents. Again, we see 
it's generally within a predictable, <clears throat> but we've had a period in the, recently where it's, it went up, but actually the restraints didn't. The restraints made remain very low. On all the wards where we've seen reductions, we have not seen any increase in PRM meds and we've not seen any increase in transfers to PICU. It's hard work trying to transfer somebody to a PICU, I have to say. There seems to be a lot of inflexibility um, in terms of being able to move people out of an acute mental health inpatient environment. Um, I think some work needs to be done around that pathway. And again, PRM meds below 10 and PICUs have generally been below 2. They're pretty standard and they've not changed at all. Some of the things that we've picked up with staff is we're essentially asking the staff to be less restrictive. And I used to call staff when I watched them on the wards, um, they used to do a Tommy Cooper move. Every time there was a noise, they'd, they'd be up with their hands. And they, there was this kind of constantly doing this. Um, now what I see is when something happens, they get up quietly, they walk out, they go and check what's going on. They don't rush in there like it's emergency ward 10. Um, sometimes they back off, so they don't intervene at all. And sometimes they will cross their fingers and hope that it's going to be all right. And generally, it is. Um, and some staff have said it's really anxiety-provoking doing that, just to step away. Um, if somebody's being violent and throwing chairs, let them throw a chair. Just leave them be, and it'll fit, it'll calm down. And it has. Um, but staff do feel a need to just get in there and stop it. Um, and it, it's this kind of back off bit. All the work we've been doing, as I say, it's ongoing. We've developed a toolkit. Um, and alongside that, we're trying to develop baseline assessments for each element of the six core strategies. In that toolkit, there's um, case studies, top tips, um, access to templates around quality improvement. Um, and we're looking at spreading this over the next eight months with the, with the same trust to, to more of the wards. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs>